If I could give this message a title this morning, it would be the unmanufactured oil. The unmanufactured oil. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Amen. Zechariah 4 verse 1. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who was wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And so I said, I am looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And there is a strand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. There are two olive trees by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other to the left. And so I answered and spoke to the angel who talked to me, saying, What are these things, my Lord? And then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And he said, No, my Lord. And he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and you shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it that you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. When I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and to the left? And I further answered and said to him, What are the two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two golden pipes from the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. We're looking at in this passage a time when the children of Israel had returned back from Babylon and they're going to begin rebuilding the temple. You'll remember that because of their sin, they were carried away to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. He came with his armies and he carried off all of the stuff that was there. One thing left that we never found after that, and that's the Ark of the Covenant. It was taken. But the candlestick, that is to say the lampstand, and all of the other utensils were taken away to Babylon. And the temple was completely destroyed. And so it had been 70 years that the children of Israel had been in captivity. And it had been 70 years since they had had a temple. The scripture talks about them hanging their harps on the willow and all these things that happened while they were in Babylon. But the word came forth from Cyrus and they went back and started on this project. First of all, you had Zerubbabel and then you had another individual who was the high priest by the name of Joshua. If you go back to the third chapter, you will see they're getting ready to start the work. And the scripture said that Satan rose up to withstand them as they started to do the work. Anytime we start to do something for God, the devil is going to stand up. He is going to cause a problem. But the Lord in this passage rebuked the devil and they began to move forward in the building of the temple. Now understand that these things are our picture language. It's all just an example. This is the type and shadow of what ultimately is going to be the church or going to be the temple that is made without hands, the living stones, that is to say, the people of God. And the priests are being told in the third chapter, this is vitally important, that they are to live clean lives. I'm just going to summarize it for you. Here you have the high priest. And he is there, and he's got these dirty garments. He's got this dirty turban on his head, which is representative of a sinful life. And God takes away his filthy garments, and he gives him garments that are clean. 
He gives them a turban on his head that is clean. The Bible asks this question, who shall ascend into the hill of God? Who shall stand on his holy mountain? They who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, they shall receive the blessing of the Lord. Saints, if we're ever to be successful, if we're ever to see God move the way that he wants to move among us, we have to live a life that is clean, that is holy before the Lord. Now, if we stumble, if we sin, we can confess our sin and the blood of Christ will cleanse us. But we mustn't take advantage of this and think, well, I have the blood. I can go on living however I want. No, because we are a kingdom of priests unto God. And God wants us, in the language of the old timers, to live right before the Lord. How many of you are with me this morning? We need to live right before the Lord because there is a work to be done. There are tremendous challenges that are before us. Saints, there is demonic activity. There are things that are going on without which, the, without the power of God. Listen, we are hopeless to do anything. There are people that are bound by sin. There are people that have got issues in their life. And the only thing that is going to set them free is the power of God. Yes. That is it. There is no other hope. They've tried every pill at CVS. It doesn't help. They still got problems. They smoke stuff. They drink stuff. They're doing everything. They can't find relief. They're turning to everything, saints. But listen, it takes the power of the living God to set people free. And it takes people who are willing to live right in order to see God's manifest power in the midst of his people. And this is what we see in Zechariah chapter 3. You see, we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We're given garments, and we are not to be staining these garments. We were at lunch here a while back, and I was talking about when I was a kid, my mom bought us the tough skins. I remember them, tough skins. Any of you men wear tough skins? You know what they did? They said, well, you know, these boys are going to knock the knee out of these, so we'll go ahead and put a patch on it now. So they, they bought them. They had a patch right over the knee. I mean, it's kind of tacky looking, really looking back. But the idea was you were going to keep them from knocking a hole in it. And I remember my mom one day, she said, Now when you go to school, don't you knock the knee out of them pants. I said, Okay, Mom. And I remember went to school and all day long, I was real careful. Didn't knock the knee out. But what did I do? I was about from here to that wall from home. And I said, Oh, I'm home. I'm going to go show Mom my pants. And I started running. I couldn't wait to go in the room and show her how I didn't knock the knee out. Right before I got to the stairs, I tripped on the crack. You need to mix this up. And I knocked the knee right out of the front of those pants. And I never forget the disappointment. My own personal, I remember just doing something like this. Like, I can't believe it. And saints, listen, we got to be careful as Christians that we don't live careless and knock the knee out of our britches. Saints, when you go out this door, don't you knock the knee out of your pants. How many of you are still with me? Yes. I thought somebody shouted me down. Yeah. Don't go out there and knock the knee out of your britches. Right. See, you say, well, well, if you do, mom's got a can iron and patch over it. That's okay. But we're going to try to keep these pants in good working order. And see, that's the thing. We have garments that the Lord has given us. He's given us clean garments. Yeah. Spotless. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. How many of you remember it? Amen. You remember the words to the, to the song? It begins with the chorus, chorus. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment? In the crucified are you washed in the blood of the Lamb. Here in these last days, when the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Yes, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will you be ready for the mansion's bride? Yes. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside your garments that are stained with sin yes. and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because there's a fountain flowing for the soul that's unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
Saints, listen. The Lord washes our garments so that they can be clean. But He doesn't do it so we can go out and just get them filthy all over again. Amen. He wants us to live a life that is clean before the Lord as best as we can. Of course, if we sin, we do have an advocate with the Father, but let's not try to go there. Let's try to live our life holy before God. Amen. You see, there's, this is just a way of saying that God will cleanse us of our disobedient past. But we need to keep on living an obedient life Amen. after that. That's what sin is. It's disobedience to what we know is God's will. What we know is God's word. That is what the stain is. We need to be obedient to his word. And we need to be obedient to the dealings of the Holy Spirit. If God prompts me in some kind of way. And I feel and I know that that's the Holy Spirit. I need to be obedient. Yes. Amen. Now sometimes God will deal differently with different people. He may put something on my heart that he may not put on your heart. He may put restrictions in my life that are not in your life. The old time preachers used to say something like this. Others can, but you cannot. Now some people may be living this certain way. But if you intend to be used of God, you cannot. Yes. If you really want to be used of God, you have to live a certain way. Amen. If you learn anything from the priesthood, if you learn anything from the Old Testament is... The closer you get to God, the more obedient you need to be. And saints, I want to live close to the Lord. You see, in chapter 4, God gave the prophet a vision. He gave him a dream, as it were, of a lampstand. It had two olive trees beside it that was feeding directly into the lampstand. There was no machinery. Now, ordinarily, they would crush these olives until they had olive oil. And they would take this oil and they would give this oil to the priests in Israel. And they would use it in the service of God. It was the responsibility of the people to bring the oil for the priests. In other words, it was, that was their task. But it's different here. This is God directly, if you like, anointing them for service. No intermediary. No machinery. This is God's direct hand. And it is a very powerful thing. And saints, this is a picture of God beginning to work in building the church. In Sunday school, we talked about it this morning, how that when Jesus originally started out, he sent the disciples out. How many of you remember? Two by two. Read down at the bottom of our text here in Zechariah 4. There were two anointed ones, one on each side that were there. And saints, this is the pattern of it. It's not always the way it works. Sometimes it could be different. But generally speaking, this is a way of saying God is sending forth His ministry, His way, in His power and in His authority. You see, the lampstand represented the light that was going to be shining in the world. Saints, listen, you are the light of the world. You are. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And in those days, understand, the only type of light that existed came from fire. That's it. As a matter of fact, even the sun is a burning fire. You see on the news sometimes they'll say, oh, there was a big sunspot that happened. There may be some power outages and knockouts. There could be some cell phones go down. Because the sun will give off a flame. And it will send a shock wave across to the earth. And it impacts us all the way here. But the very energy with which I am speaking this morning came from the fire of the sun. Yes. Think of it. The sun is what provided the light necessary for the plants through the process that you remember from high school, photosynthesis, to turn light energy into carbohydrate energy. So here you have animals that eat the grass because of the light that is shining down, causing them to grow. So think of the awesomeness of this. I am moving and animating this morning from the fire that came from the sun. And saints, listen, in this present evil world of darkness, you and I are the light of the world. Amen. We cannot be light if we are not burning. We have to be burning. 
When we receive the Holy Spirit, how many of you remember we used to sing it? It's the Holy Ghost and, and it's keeping me alive. What is it? It's the Holy Ghost and you see, we're burning with the very presence of the Lord. You see, here's the way this works. This is the simplicity of it. I bring to the relationship, because understand that this is synergistic. It's like riding a bicycle. God does his part, I do my part. God does his part, I do my part. How many of you like them one-sided relationships? Anybody? You do all the calling. You do all the saying I love you. Yeah. You do all the work. And the other person never contributes. How many of you like those? Nope. How far do they go? Not far, right? See, God said, while we were yet sinners, God committed His love to, to us. Christ died for us. Yes, God. For God so loved the world. This is God pushing the pedal. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. How is our response? Lord, thank you so much. I love you. I appreciate you. You turn the next pedal. And see, it becomes a reciprocal re relationship. And our responsibility turning over here is simple obedience. Yes. That's what it is. It's obedience. You obey the Lord, you're pushing down your pedal. God speaks to you, shows you something in His Word, you push down the pedal, that's your job. He's already pedaling. He doesn't need to be prompted. I mean, it's all the, the, the ball is always in our court because he's already pushed the pedal around for us again. Then we obey again. It's another picture, saints, of walking in the Spirit. Yes. It's one thing right after the next, after the next, after the next, of being obedient. And see, when that obedience, which represents my love for the Lord, you say, how does it work? For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. Right? If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, my Father and I will come. We will manifest ourselves to you. If you will keep my commandments, my Father and I will come and make our home with you. What is God? He is a fire. What was he to Abraham? He was a smoking fire. What was he to Moses? He was a burning fire on the mountain from which the word of God came forth from the fire that was in the mountain. It came down in the form of of ten words or ten commandments. So God is a fire. So when I bring my obedience to the picture, I am bringing my fire, my love for God. And He answers by His fire. And when you put those two together, saints, we begin to burn for God. We become a light shining in this dark world. The only light this world could have. Is us burning. What did Jesus say? We talked about it in Sunday school. No one lights a lamp. And then puts it under the bed. And I said this. And this, this is a review for some of you. When you got scared as a kid. Where do people norm, where do kids normally go when they get scared? To the earth. Where at? In the room. Where do they hide? Under the bed. Under the bed. It's amazing. 2,000 years been, this has been going on. Somebody gets scared, you know, they hide under the bed. Or if they want to get rid of something, they don't want somebody to find where they put it. Under the bed. Under the bed. What did Jesus say? No one lights a lamp and then hides it under the bed. In other words, God is saying, when I light you to do my service, when I anoint you to do my service, I don't want you to run high. Like a little kid would go hide under his bed. But he said, I will set you on a lampstand. That's what I want to do. In other words, I'm going to place you different places in your life. And wherever I put you, I intend for you to burn for me. The more obedient you are, the more God responds with fire. And the brighter you burn. That's the picture. You live in obedience. He brings his fire and it just gets brighter and brighter. He told the church at Ephesus, I'll remove your lampstand unless you repent. What had happened? They had left their first love. How do you express your love for God? By obedience. 
by serving the Lord, by honoring Him. When that began to go out, saints, hear what I'm telling you. When that fire started to flicker in that church, the Lord stopped and said, Look, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand. Why? Because if that fire goes out, it'd be like taking the microphone off this mic stand. What, what use is it? If it doesn't have a microphone, what's the purpose of the stand? And if there is no fire on the lamp, then it's nothing more, I've said this millions of times it seems, than a stumbling block in a darkened room. Because you just trip over it. And saints, without the fire of God in a, in a Christian life, without the fire of God in a church, all we're doing is breeding atheism. Because it's just mundane, dead Christianity. It doesn't have life. It doesn't do anything to move anyone. The old timers used to say, if you'll get on fire for God, they'll come just to watch you burn. They'll come to the church just to watch you burn. Yes. Saints, listen, I want to burn for Jesus. I want to burn for the Lord. I want to be used of God. I don't want the machinery of man's ability. I don't want to figure it out so that we know how to do it. Because we, 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 we know how to do church. So we just go through the motions. And there's no life there. And people come in and they say, somebody lied to me. They say God was here and God is not there. Like I heard that Pompeii had done at one point. Went into the, the temple. God is not here. I never want that to be, saints. In the house of God. Among God's people. How different would it be if somebody came in here and said, Ooh, I sense the presence of the Lord in this place. Not because we're manufacturing it with music. We're not manufacturing it with music. We're not manufacturing it with environment and atmosphere. We're not doing anything to try to cause people to think that this is the presence of the Lord. I was in England one time, and I was in one of the largest cathedrals in the world. And you talk about an awesome place. When I came up to that and I seen it on the hill, it was the largest building I'd ever seen. But I remember going in this, and here is this building that the ceiling is so high, I have no idea how you would ever get up there to do anything. And I was just, I was like, wow. I said, this is what they talked about in the Middle Ages of anagogic architecture. Okay, you don't have to remember that. Anagogic. It means that when you come into the building, it is so awesome and magnificent that it causes your thoughts to go towards heaven. And then they would add to it stained glass windows that are four or five stories tall, probably 20, 30 feet wide, and the, the light would come through and just glisten all through the room. And then they would get on the organ and begin to play. And I mean, it was nearly about to bust my eardrums as they're playing on this organ. One of these songs that I like, wow. And the guy's with me. He's standing beside me. And he looked over at me and he said, if you didn't know better, you would think this is the presence of the Lord. But it's not. It's the building. It's the atmosphere. Saints, listen. Yes. I don't want machinery. Amen. I don't want fraudulence. Yes. I don't want fakery. Amen. I want the real thing. Yes. Amen. I want the same presence of God that would be in this place whether I had a microphone or whether I was speaking without it. The same power and unction and authority if whether if we sang a cappella or if we had a hundred piece choir behind us and 17 instruments. Because sometimes people confuse the music with the presence of God, and it's yes. not the same thing. That's right. Amen. Amen. It's not the same thing. Saints, listen. This is the picture here. The oil went directly from the tree, no machinery, to the lamp. Directly. And saints, that's what I want in my life. I want to just be able to say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Yes. I don't need no machinery. I don't need to drum something up. I just want you to fill me, Lord, right now to the full with oil. Fill me, Lord, because I want to do your work. Not programs, not human strategies, and not human visions. But what the Lord is leading and saying. 
Saints, that's the difference. So long as it's man-made, it's going to be hay, wood, and stubble. One of these days, the fire is going to be applied to it. It's going to go up in flames. I mean, it's going to go up like a Roman candle when God puts the fire to it. But if it's what we have done from His direction, under His anointing, in obedience to His sending, in the right spirit, yielding the fruit of the Spirit in our life, God will bring forth, saints, a great victory. And He will build this church. Upon this rock I will build my church, said Jesus, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If I build it just by myself, oh, I've got an idea. Let's try this. No. Or why don't, we, why don't we do this? This is working at so-and-so's church. They're running 2,000. No. Listen, saints. It is not by might, nor by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. I want you to see what this is in the Hebrew. Okay? It's not by might. It's not by, like, the strength of an army. That's the word. It's not like the strength of an army, like a multitude. You'll remember when David numbered Israel and got in trouble with God. He was thinking in terms of numbers. Oh, we've got 400,000. We ought to be able to whip the Philistines now. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. Because God doesn't need 100,000. He only needs it. one to put a thousand, two to put ten thousand to flight. Yeah. See, it's not about numbers. It's about obedience. Yeah. It's about our willingness to do what God is saying to do. Saints, God can do an amazing thing through a handful of people whose heart is right towards Him. It's not by mind nor by power. That is one person, one maybe charismatic figure. Say, so, oh, we need a real charismatic figure to get something done. No, we don't. I think about Paul the Apostle. You know, we look back at him now and say, he was a great man of God. It's not how they viewed him in his day. Do you know, you know what he said to the Corinthians? He says, I hear what you're saying about me. You say things like this. His letters are heavy and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak. And his speech is contemptible of no account. That's how they thought of him in that day. People didn't think anything of him. They wouldn't have come to hear him speak. But God has used him powerfully down through the ages. 2,000 years later, we're still reading the writings of Paul, talking about the exploits he did. Why? Because he was this great articulate man who could string the words. So, no, 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 no. It was when he spoke, he spoke with an unction from the Holy Spirit. It was the authority of God that was going forward as he was ministering. You see, it's not by human power. It's not by human strategy. But it is by my spirit. Yes. Saints, listen. When God is moving powerfully, it is amazing how easy a service can go. I was at a tractor pull recently, and ever since I was there, I was there last year, but I was thinking about a service being like a tractor pull, some of the men are what I'm talking about. Sometimes you feel like that guy in that tractor, you know, he's hooked up on the sled. And you start going into service, and you're going full bore, and all of a sudden that weight gets to the top, and that front end starts to dig down, and then it's like, then your wheels just start spinning. Run, run, run. A service can be like that, saints. No wheels on the front, just dragging it down the aisle, as it were. But saints, listen. When God is moving by His Spirit, when we are in unity, and God is moving powerfully, miracles can come about. Is there anything too hard for God? The saints God is able to save people that you think can't be saved. That's right. Amen. He's able to move in circumstances that you don't think that God can move in. He's able to change people that you think can't be changed. Right. I've told you this before and it bears repeating. 
I had two, an uncle and my dad, who both were alcoholics. There were other alcoholics in the family, but these were the worst. And I used to think, my uncle will get saved, but my dad never will. My dad will never be saved. I used to sit and watch him sit on the edge of his chair in total darkness and stare at the television. His eyes would seem like they were coming out of their sockets, totally intoxicated. Go to bed and pass out in the bed that night. Get up and go to work the next day. He was a functioning alcoholic. He did that all the time. I was all my childhood, all the way into my teenage years. And then he told me, he said, Robert, one day I just put that beer up in my mouth and something was in that can. God delivered him that day. Thank you, Jesus. Delivered him of smoking cigarettes all of his life. I was shocked and amazed. It wasn't just that. He called him to minister. And the next thing you know, he's operating in children's ministry, the very ministry that brought his sons to church when they were little boys when he would still be recovering from a really rough night. But then he started coming to the service with us in the shut-ins. I can still remember standing next to my dad, singing them bluegrass songs. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. I can still hear his voice singing with me. You say, how did it happen? It's not by mind. It's not by power. It was by my spirit, saith the Lord. That was the hand of God. It wasn't some great preaching. Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, it's not by mind. It is not by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. Lord, help us to understand the significance of those words. Lord, through the hopelessness that we see, when we see the hopelessness and we are tempted to take matters into our own hands and try to do it ourselves, help us to know Lord, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. Lord, help us to trust in you like the disciples who were told not to take a script or a purse or an extra garment, but to go trusting, Lord. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name.